Доброе утро. Меня зовут Рахим Шакбаев, и я рад вас приветствовать в качестве модератора на Астана Finance Day. Наша утренняя сессия называется «Национальные приоритеты Казахстана на современном этапе развития». В нашей сессии, организуемой Агентством стратегического планирования и реформы Республики Казахстан, принимает участие сэр Сума Чакрабарти, советник президента Республики Казахстан, заместитель председателя Высшего совета по реформам при президенте РК. Господин Кайрат Келимбетов, председатель Агентства по стратегическому планированию и развитию и реформам. Господин Алибек Куантыров, прошу прощения, Тимур Жаксылыков, вице-министр национальной экономики. И господин Агрис Прейманис, директор, глава по Казахстану, Европейский банк реконструкции и развития. Спасибо большое за участие. У нас запланирована дискуссия в пределах 50 минут. Я полагаю, где-то минут 40 мы с вами подискутируем на заявленную тему, и минут 10 мы оставим на ответы на вопросы, которые могут поступать в рамках нашей трансляции на сайте МФЦА. Если позволите, наверное, первый вопрос, такой сквозной, я предложу ответить всем в формате БЛИЦ в пределах 2-3-4 минут. Безусловно, он должен касаться пандемии. Все пошло. And uh, yes, of course, uh, we will talk about uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the current Corona crisis. There have been many uh, assessments, many takes. Most of them have been either too optimistic or too pessimistic. But we've been living in this pandemic uh, for at least one hour, one year and a half, and there, there is time now uh, to draw some conclusions how to balance uh, uh, health and safety on the one hand, and on the other hand, economy and equality, economic equality. So what are the key takes uh, from this one year and a half uh, of uh, the pandemic? Uh, what the experience of which countries you would pick as uh, a model, a potential model for an exit strategy out of this? Uh, Mr. Kilimbetov, I would like uh, to give the floor to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I believe if, uh, now uh, there is analysis of how the governments of different countries have coped uh, for Kazakhstan. The assessment is overall positive, uh, as uh, BCG uh, has uh, uh, recommended uh, the three F uh, model. Uh, first, you have uh, to uh, fight uh, for people's lives, uh, uh, find a, a public health response, uh, then also overcome uh, economic crisis consequences, especially for SMEs and the loss of jobs uh, and the future growth. That's number three. Kazakhstan has uh, earmarked uh, an unprecedented 9% of GDP. That's 1.8 trillion tenge has been spent on uh, job support, uh, subsidized uh, credits uh, have been extended to the tune of 1 trillion tenge. And uh, overall of uh, this uh, cushion as uh, part of uh, the national fund uh, transfers of uh, this uh, cushion uh, has uh, given people some confidence and the country some confidence uh, because uh, all the value, global value added uh, chains uh, have been disrupted. And uh, globalization is now in crisis, in flux. Uh, a lot of uh, supply chains have been disrupted, but nevertheless, uh, in health, uh, in economic growth, uh, we believe uh, that the government is definitely keeping its uh, fingers on the pulse of the situation. Public health concerns uh, are also there. We also see new variants uh, of uh, COVID-19 of the coronavirus and we see different uh, responses so uh, uh, so for me the best example is the united states and israel where uh, huge majorities of population have been vaccinated uh, that means that there is herd immunity in place uh, and however different mutations uh, appear uh, people still will be protected and i think uh, that is uh, the best response uh, there is and uh, if we can move into the epidemiological green zone, we can also move into the uh, economic uh, green zone with no uh, risks uh, for jobs or economic activities. The government of Kazakhstan also has some good plans uh, for herd immunity. There is a schedule of vaccination. And if we stick to that schedule, Kazakhstan also will be in a good position from the point of view of the pandemic response uh, and also from the point of view of the economic response for future sustainable growth. Thank you, Mr. Kilimbetov. Uh, so, Chukrabarti. 
Dr. Suma. I have the same question for you. Uh, what conclusions uh, can we already draw from the one year and a half of the pandemic? Uh, and what is the best experience uh, there is that Kazakhstan can borrow? Thank you very much. Um, well, I think if you look at uh, which countries cope best with the crisis, um, I think you have to think in terms of two phases. The first phase of actually just managing the crisis, containing it uh, and dealing with it, I think without a doubt, East Asia and Australasia did uh, the best, without a doubt. If you look at the minimizing the number of deaths as, a, as an indicator. And if you look at the second phase, particularly in terms of vaccination rates and so on, uh, yes, Kairat quite rightly mentioned the US and Israel, but actually UK has actually done better than the US. Um, so the UK is actually the top country in Europe uh, on vaccination rates. But UK did it, had a very bad first phase. So it's interesting how some countries have done better in, and as did the US, actually very bad first phase. So it's interesting how some countries have done better in one phase rather than another, uh, which I think says something about different aspects of their planning um, systems as well. But Kazakhstan, I mean, like many other countries, I think the key issue, uh, I would say there are several key issues, but I'd mention a few. One is that we have to have a job, uh, jobs-led recovery. Uh, a lot of jobs, of course, went during the COVID uh, period, during the pandemic. And so SMEs uh, and particularly thinking about issues of particular cohorts of workers who lost their jobs first. I suspect we will see, have seen more women uh, out of work uh, and as uh, last in, first out, and often in crises. I think certain regions have suffered more. So I think we have to have a, you know, quite a focus on where the jobs are, but without the state trying to direct uh, all the traffic as well. The second issue is about the state. I mean, one of the things I think uh, you see in this crisis is the state has had to be, in every country, including Kazakhstan, much more active. And actually reforms of the state have been delayed because of that. There is a risk in, not just in this country, but in others that people get, have got rather comfortable with the state uh, being the leader during this pandemic. And it may be difficult for the state to withdraw uh, from certain activity to actually push back towards a more market-led model. That's obviously what we would all like to see. Uh, and that's certainly my role as advisor to the president here in Kazakhstan is pushing very much a much more market economy-led model uh, going forward. So I think pushing ahead with certain uh, agendas like improving the investment climate further, privatization, which has been delayed for a number of years, that will be very, very important uh, going forward as well. The other area I would highlight, and of course, this is um, partly because there's a big international event this year, COP26, to which the president will attend, I think, um, is building that better does mean actually a more sustainable uh, development future for Kazakhstan. So the low carbon pathway, that Kazakhstan needs to develop uh, is going to be testing. It's an oil and gas dominated economy. We all know that. Uh, coal uh, generation produces a huge amount of our power in this country. Um, but those days are gone, really. We have to move forward with a low carbon approach. And so this will be a big test because it will have to change the economic structure of uh, Kazakhstan, but also our behavior as citizens and consumers. Uh, our lifestyle changes will have to take place as well. And that's a big role for the state to try and persuade all of us to actually make a change at a personal level, as well as an economic policy level. So I think there are several things that are coming up. Uh, and I think the government, to give them a lot of credit, actually is focusing on exactly these issues. Thank you. Timur Mikesevich. Uh, Timur Mikesevich. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, for your question. Uh, so, and uh, I guess I will uh, concur with all the opinions that have been stated uh, before me. Of course, uh, this crisis uh, is uh, comprehensive, if I may say so. Uh, it has hit, it has impacted uh, pretty much growth across the board. Uh, it has hit welfare, well being, even. And uh, countries uh, reacted, and the world reacted pretty much in the same vein. Uh, first efforts, early efforts uh, zeroed in on containment on the uh, 
containment of the spread of the infection. Some countries uh, did it uh, better, some countries uh, did worse. And uh, as Mr. Chakrabarty, there are also interesting things uh, that uh, those countries uh, that didn't really like put themselves well that well during phase one have really shown good results, enviable results uh, during phase two because of mass vaccination, the mass rollout of vaccination. Uh, what is going on in Kazakhstan at this point? Uh, of course, uh, it's clear that vaccination is ongoing. It is accelerating, if I may say so. And uh, the government's uh, plans are called for uh, 60 percent of vaccination by the fall of this year. And if we do that, if we stick to that plan, we will definitely uh, stem the spread of the infection. And in terms of uh, economic efforts uh, of all the governments, and that includes Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan is no exception here, is that most countries focused on SMEs, because uh, the SMEs have borne the brunt of the economic impact. They're the most vulnerable to job losses, to loss of economic activity. And if you look at across the board, pretty much all the governments uh, uh, have focused on that. In Kazakhstan, we also uh, concentrated our efforts uh, on SME support. But now, uh, a year later, uh, from the onset of the crisis, uh, a year on into the pandemic, uh, our results uh, are, pre are pretty good. If I say so myself, uh, if you look at SME output, uh, it hasn't shrunk. Uh, the number of uh, operating businesses hasn't shrunk. Actually, it has gone up a little bit. When, uh, in the manufacturing sector, we also see a bump, significant growth, uh, and that applies uh, to light industry, uh, to machinery building, uh, to the chemical industry, and pretty much across the manufacturing sector. Uh, where we have reduction uh, in different SME subsectors, uh, that's they have to do with uh, uh, provision of final goods uh, to consumers. So, uh, hospitality, the hospitality industry, uh, public eateries, uh, uh, retail, of course, has suffered. That's why we see losses. So, and in those uh, SME sectors, we have significant reductions. Uh, however, as uh, Kazakhstan vaccinates more and more people, as vaccination rates go up, we believe uh, that, uh, and actually that's the way we have uh, high hopes, that's where we put our hopes in, uh, that with greater vaccination rates, our economic activity also will get a boost, unless of, unless of course uh, there is a, a new contingency, new variants appear out of nowhere, because uh, the Delta variant is just one example, the more might be in a pipeline. Uh, so all, speaking overall about the conclusions uh, that we should draw, uh, so, uh, first of all, of course, we should uh, put emphasis on digitalization, uh, on uh, providing opportunities uh, for remote work and remote access to services, be it public or private services equally. Number two. Uh, so, of course, SME, uh, SMEs, uh, because uh, SMEs account uh, for the lion's share of employment, uh, and they also account uh, for a significant portion of econ overall economic activity. Looking back, uh, in hindsight, uh, five years back, we see that out of uh, 10 jobs created, eight were created by SMEs, and that's why SMEs as, as important as never before. They are absolutely paramount. And the second conclusion uh, that we need to uh, spend uh, even more effort uh, on uh, uh, crisis support for SMEs for job support. Uh, and uh, those are probably the main conclusions uh, that I believe we should be in a position to draw, to draw right now. And the third important conclusion, of course, is public health, uh, human health. Uh, that's uh, number one, and that probably will remain uh, for foreseeable future because uh, uh, the uh, corona crisis uh, is definitely is not a short-term situation. Uh, probably it will be at least mid-term, and it will be a reality for quite some time to come. Thank you very much. So I fully agree with you that the corona crisis is definitely uh, here uh, 
to stay. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you definitely have had the opportunity so, to see uh, the successes and failures of different country strategies. So please uh, share your take. Uh, thank you very much, Rahim. Uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, even after one year and a half uh, uh, since the onset uh, of the pandemic, it's probably way too early to make any kind of generalized uh, conclusion. So which strategies uh, have played out well, which haven't, uh, because in many countries, the situation is fraught, still fraught, with many difficulties so what i would like uh, to focus uh, is just one thing uh, which is uh, the exit a possible exit strategy from the pandemic uh, and uh, speaking in more concrete terms uh, as we all understand uh, during the pandemic uh, the role of the state has grown exponentially uh, and especially when it comes uh, to fiscal support uh, both uh, to the populace at large and uh, to uh, businesses uh, in uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan here uh, has been quite successful in terms of uh, uh, fiscal stimulus, uh, fiscal support. Uh, and uh, last year, because of the effort that the government of Kazakhstan did take uh, because of that fiscal stimulus, uh, Kazakhstan was able to avoid uh, a precipitate crisis, a precipitous drop in GDP. Uh, but now it's time, it is time now uh, to start thinking about uh, moving away from that uh, fiscal stimulus and moving away from the over prominent overbearing role of uh, the government uh, and uh, because uh, there is this moral hazard that people and companies alike will get used to that support everybody is talking about this uh, in europe in the uk in germany uh, pretty much across the board that it's important uh, to find the right time and the right method to roll back that fiscal stimulus. Uh, and uh, talking about the European example, so Germany probably is mentioned uh, most uh, often as a good example uh, that uh, Germany spent a lot of uh, euros uh, on uh, company support, but now Germany is rolling it back ever so slowly. And uh, companies are now getting signals uh, that they should uh, now from, from here on out uh, rely on their own wherewithal rely on their own wits and focus on market-driven solutions. And uh, for Kazakhstan, uh, there is also a question, a big question mark, when to do it and how to do it, the, the rollback of the fiscal stimulus. Because even the crisis uh, struck in Kazakhstan had a lot of uh, stimulus packages in play. And uh, this crisis, and hopefully the end of this crisis, and I'm seeing the light at the end of this panel, uh, we now need to think about how to restructure and uh, overhaul uh, government support programs in Kazakhstan. And uh, during the crisis, uh, our support was uh, that we needed to uh, support everybody across the board, population and companies, and that was probably right. But now we need to share it. Now, now we need to be much more strategic about where we spent that support money, those supports can get in, in which sectors, in which population segments. And also we need uh, to be much more uh, flexible and much, and much smarter about uh, support instruments and the choice of uh, support instruments. Uh, because uh, support instruments uh, can uh, crowd out a uh, private channel and they can distort uh, market signals. Uh, so uh, coming out of this pandemic probably is the right time for us to think about uh, how to roll back in a smart way government support, public support. And if money is provided, then no more than 50% of what the project requires in order for companies to uh, seek uh, and to tap uh, private money market and uh, markets and capital markets. We also need uh, to create uh, uh, right signals for companies. Uh, talking about the uh, European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, EBRD, uh, we have uh, green economy programs. Uh, under this program, uh, support is provided to companies only with the proviso, with the proviso that they can show proof of concept, that they can show results from investment. Uh, in Kazakhstan, probably you need to restructure your programs in, in a similar vein to make sure that only those companies get support that are viable 
viable, that have viable product. And at, at this uh, point in time, you know, uh, when, we, when we're thinking about an exit strategy uh, from the pandemic, uh, aside uh, from the strategic issues uh, that uh, Karat and Suma uh, mentioned, uh, uh, also it's important to talk about practical aspects, uh, how to change uh, uh, company support and how to send the right signal to companies uh, for them to be much more competitive uh, and at the same time to distort market signals as uh, least as possible. That's probably the most important thing. But uh, for vaccination, I definitely need to say a couple of words about vaccination because I am in Kazakhstan right now and we definitely need to bump up significantly vaccination rates. And undoubtedly, the latest initiatives uh, of the government of Kazakhstan to incentivize uh, the population to go for greater vaccination, that is the right way to go because without vaccination, we won't ever come out of this crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I agree with you, and definitely the support to the company should be reduced, should be revised, should be changed, and this is the task for all the governments globally, and how it could be combined uh, with a stimulus of certain changes to the structure of the economy under the new reality. Uh, Mr. Kalimbetov, uh, as we are all aware, we are undergoing through the major overloading of the entire system of strategic planning and the president uh, instructed to create new national projects and uh, the new body is established to manage investment projects and the key mission of it to create strategic uh, projects and identify the priorities and uh, uh, during this week we had the, there was a meeting of the supreme council for priorities and the list of national projects for the five year pre uh, period was defined uh, could you um, make us familiar with the approach to uh, setting up the priorities and uh, speak about this project. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rahim. But I would rather start with... Uh, ...saying that the, the guidelines uh, to uh, reload uh, the entire system of strategic planning of the country was uh, issued uh, in September last year. So during the three stages of the uh, combating crisis, uh, such as epidemiological uh, status and the Ministry of Health and uh, the entire system of health uh, care is still under a major shock, shock requiring a lot of um, uh, reloading. And this is abnormal. And in fact, it, it is the same globally, given the various waves of the disease. This is on the one hand. And secondly, there was an immediate response and our cushion helped uh, with social support, uh, creating new jobs, jobs creation through the development of infrastructure. And obviously we used for that uh, the funds of the National Oil Fund and the cost of the budget increased and uh, we faced the budget deficit and this situation, and we should not hope that this is not this is going to be permanent. We need to look into the future. And it is the president who guided all the national bodies to look into the future a little bit. And when we see what is happening in Kazakhstan and Globally, we can see that a lot is being changed and pandemic uh, has accelerated uh, some of the major mega trends that we are observing. Well, first of all, it has become clear, especially now when the price of oil barrel has increased. But in general, it was obvious that uh, the dependence of the global economy on oil will be somewhat different and uh, we can always rely upon the super cycle on oil. This is not possible. And uh, therefore, the entire economic or business model of the state uh, needs to be reloaded. Uh, what would be the sources of the budget in the future? Uh, in the uh, What would be the source of economic growth in the future? And in the background of the decarbonization trend, uh, since Kazakhstan is mostly exporting to European Union and China, and we are aware that all these two the econom economies are very much uh, uh, committed to the new standards of green economy and uh, environment protection measures. And we know that uh, European Union, Union is planning to introduce the carbon tax. So in general, there are lots of signals showing that uh, the attitude to the oil and gas sector um, investments are, is changing. And uh, so these two trends of geopolitical uh, trade wars and 
between certain countries changed the uh, picture of the world and for Kazakhstan to understand what would be our strategy and what should we uh, rely upon and what should be should we invest first of all uh, meaning not only the short-term support measures such as uh, job creation and uh, temporary support of the welfare to see to what extent this model is sustainable in the future. Therefore, the Supreme Council for Reforms uh, was established, uh, chaired by the president, and Sir Sh Sh Suma Chakrabati is the uh, advisor, and all the major agencies are members, such as National Bank, Agency for Regulations and Government, and uh, President's Office. Uh, Atemikian Chamber is also a member. Where they, they discuss uh, what should be the strategy. You know that in February, the National Development Plan until 2025 was um, issued. This is the um, analog of uh, what was done before, uh, the part of the strategy for uh, 2050 that defined uh, the national priorities. Uh, there are targeting issues, uh, there are issues related to the 10 priorities of the country development in the three key areas. They include welfare of people, first of all, and this is the key priority that the president defines uh, fair social policy, accessible health uh, system, quality education, uh, quality of institutions, a new model of uh, state governance, uh, fair and uh, uh, growing state. These aspects are paid a lot of attention to uh, during the implementation of the follow up national projects, uh, uh, and of course the strong economy, a strong diversified innovative economy that was mentioned by Timur. In fact, it is indeed very important that we are going through the accelerated development of the technologies, the so-called fourth industrial revolution. We all felt the demand for online services in healthcare, in education, and social security. And a lot uh, of uh, many lessons were drawn, and a lot still needs to be done uh, to be in line with the demands and requirements of the society, in particular, uh, the provision of the national uh, public services. In this regard, after the priorities and targets were defined, uh, the work was started to uh, develop the national projects. Uh, you know that we are smoothly transferring from implementation of the national programs to national projects. National programs uh, played a role, and since there were the key driver of economic growth, uh, development of infrastructure. And at the same time, probably because uh, everything is changing dynamically, we need some kind of a new mechanism of governance uh, with uh, high level state tasks or objectives. And the uh, president instructed to transfer from the uh, cumbersome uh, national programs uh, to more, uh, to the national projects, more focused on the communities. And uh, national projects are the set of um, activities of the state that follow three key tasks. Uh, the, the first one is that the key, every national project has to be of the national scale, that it should cover the interest of the uh, all population of the country. Uh, secondly, uh, the national project uh, needs to have the project management system. Uh, you know that globally we are measuring the performance uh, uh, through uh, smart measurements, uh, whereby every action of the state needs to clearly define what would be the goals achieved, who is responsible for that, what would be the budget, and what would be the time frame for these uh, goals to be achieved. If it's not achieved, we would need to understand and measure the the performance. Uh, this is the approach in businesses globally, and many other many states are transferring to this approach, including Kazakhstan. And the most important is that the national project needs to be client or uh, human uh, centered, that it has to be oriented at the needs and demands of the people of Kazakhstan. And every national project should, first of all, answer the question uh, what will improve as a result of the project in the life of every person in Kazakhstan. So the, there is a very uh, stringent 
requirement to that in March and uh, June, uh, there were lot of, lots of discussions internally uh, among the national bodies and ministries uh, at, the consult at the advisory bodies uh, involving the uh, parliamentarians engaging with a, a wide panel of experts, including international ones. And uh, in general, uh, as we normally do, uh, about 40 uh, projects uh, were uh, proposed to become the candidates. You know that traditionally every ministry or agency would have, uh, would consider their key task being the most relevant and uh, the top priority. This could be right, but at the same time, there should be very clear prioritization. In, and it's not by chance that we only have 10 priorities uh, and not 110 because uh, they will not be priorities anymore. So the priorities were defined and out of 40, uh, at some interim stage, uh, 20 projects were screened, and uh, you were absolutely right to say that uh, pretty recently we discussed it at the level of the president, and at the moment, uh, 10 projects were uh, defined. Uh, this uh, 10 project is the manageable number of the state uh, support measures, including social, sphere and coming back to the lessons uh, to your f very first question uh, the key question is uh, to what extent uh, our uh, welfare will be sustainable in the long term and this is uh, what should concern all of us uh, the government the parliament the bodies responsible for strategic planning and in this regards i consider that the most important is to invest in the future invest in the human capital and it's not by chance that two of the major national projects are devoted to the healthcare system and education in particular the national program in uh, national project in healthcare sets the important objective of achieving the life uh, uh, span of 74 years and it's clear that pandemic uh, played a role in defining this uh, longevity, and uh, we all can see the dynamics of the disease and the consequences, but still the task is like this, and the objective is to uh, modernize and install the equipment in healthcare facilities in the rural areas, in the um, urban areas, and we are seriously getting prepared uh, to achieving these tasks and the homework uh, that we need to carry out uh, will be done. Uh, you know that our demographic trends uh, state that uh, the percentage of uh, youth is uh, pretty high and it's going to increase and many young people will come to the labor market and we need to be prepared for that. And uh, first of all, the issues, uh, the programs in the healthcare and coverage of education, for example, there is a um, study of the uh, World Health Organization uh, saying that the access to quality education should be provided at uh, earliest, as early stage as possible. We previously looked at it as a ministerial task, and now we are looking at it from the point of view as, uh, first of all, the investment uh, into the human capital, and secondly, to achieve the balance, uh, to remove the misbalance between the um, cities and uh, rural areas, and uh, the task is to reduce it to 2.7 times. And uh, 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 here we would measure it following the PISA measurements. Our students, uh, when they go through the uh, final test uh, in Almaty and Astana, it could be at a very high level in the south and in the rural areas, the level of uh, test results are pretty low. Uh, so we are very clearly aimed at ensuring high uh, education of um, similar quality, irrespective of the location of uh, residence of the student and uh, 
the kind of institution the uh, student is studying. Uh, and this is our aim. Uh, but secondly, this would add, add, end up in um, getting certain professions. And uh, therefore, uh, we very much uh, are interested in the number of uh, new permanent jobs created. And uh, uh, probably some other speakers will speak more about that. Uh, but we are um, relying here on the clear economic growth, uh, continuation of the industrial development, uh, investments in exploration and support to infra physical infrastructure and transport connectivity, energy infrastructure. All these uh, I, tasks uh, have been accumulated and we need to address them. This is one thing. On the, on the second hand, uh, we need to ensure connectivity between the region uh, to uh, improve the uh, basic inequalities and uh, what you are saying here is the entrepreneurship uh, program. Uh, the biggest number of uh, jobs uh, are planned to be created uh, through the national project of uh, uh, business development. Uh, this will include the development of trade, uh, tourism, creative industries and so on. Uh, that is everything that is now globally becoming the new growth points and we believe that Kazakhstan and the government uh, should be primarily focused on these efforts and uh, we are doing this big job to do that and obviously uh, the projects related to decarbonization including Jasil, Kazakhstan, uh, water management and all these problems that have been uh, accumulated and uh, we need to turn them into the new uh, positive trend and uh, need to be prepared to the commitments that uh, Kazakhstan has undertaken uh, to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2060 uh, through enhancing uh, the real income of people that which is the concern for everyone how to get new incomes how to calibrate the economic uh, equilibrium in kazakhstan on the one hand it should be the budget balance uh, the revenues and costs should be optimized uh, without eating up the uh, national fund uh, access to loans to smes uh, coordination of fiscal and uh, monetary policies all these issues are being discussed at the uh, supreme board uh, and the committees and we believe that uh, i believe that this balanced uh, economic model for the future development of kazakhstan is now emerging and we agreed and uh, uh, approved the list of the national projects. As I said, uh, they include uh, quality and accessible education, uh, quality and accessible health care, uh, the issues of enforcement. Uh, a lot of attention is paid to the technological uh, breakthrough uh, through the digitalization and the programs that uh, are saying that uh, the government should be managed uh, on the basis of data, not on the basis of statistics which is always lagging behind uh, development of innovations uh, the application of absolutely new technologies to support infrastructure including telecommunications development of entrepreneurship a lot of attention is also paid to the humanitarian uh, issues uh, including inter alia development of the cultural capacity to to develop creative industries uh, territorial development uh, strong regions and uh, which I mentioned, and the separate aspect of the agro-industrial sector development. Uh, we see the uh, capacities of export for agro-industrial sector is a great uh, dra driver of growth in our view, and the government pays a lot of attention to that. The investments are already planned. And there was a very interesting discussion that uh, normally the public bodies will uh, ask for more resources than the government uh, has available, probably twice as much. And and obvious, uh, obviously, the discussion uh, was uh, centered around uh, the uh, capacity of the government, uh, capacity of the budget, and they are limited for the 
uh, next five years uh, based on the uh, cautious forecasts uh, for the economic growth. But at the same time, the task is uh, to be uh, not so much relying upon the budget investments, but uh, trying to attract more investments. So let's speak about accessible uh, uh, lending and borrowing and uh, public-private partnerships. So the task was uh, from the president to the government to uh, be more focused on attracting more private financing. You know that July and August is the traditional uh, time frame for the Republican Budgeting Committee, and every national project would be calibrated from the point of view of the targets and financing. We know that there was a, a disadvantage that many national programs were not fully financed, and uh, resultantly, uh, we had a kind of uh, managerial collapse. Uh, that is, uh, there is no financing, but at the same time, uh, there is no one responsible to uh, to uh, be accountable for not achieving. Uh, so in this case, uh, we will have these priorities, uh, the financing will be provided, and we will be sure what and how it's going to be happening. A high priority is uh, uh, set by the president to anti-corruption, and there would be a lot of financing provided and uh, monitoring will be provided as well because this is a high responsibility to what extent uh, these uh, pr uh, procedures and uh, um, orders set up by the law uh, are enforced and how it is going to be uh, spent and the most important that I would like to call the experts to think about is that in July August there is a good time to continue discussing certain initiatives and probably uh, rethink of of, uh, some of the tasks and and uh, we will do this work with our MP so we also will work very closely with our expert communities in different configurations uh, in different compositions uh, but we would like also to see uh, the uh, expert community and society at large uh, the civil society that they all take part in this uh, because uh, a lot will change on to what extent uh, we will be successful in structuring in, in building our national project uh, because uh, a lot of uh, changes uh, will change from that, and without those changes, Kambokarisan will be very difficult to achieve sustainable growth in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Kilimbeta. For you, probably preempting a lot of questions that we have received yesterday. In terms of national projects, uh, uh, the, uh, the value of the national project is uh, 80, 80 trillion, trillion change, yeah, that's about 15 trillion a year. year. That's a four times larger than the Republican the budget, budget, actually. Uh, so, uh, and uh, President Tarkayev uh, uh, will raise some concerns about to what extent uh, the, uh, the uh, disbursement of that money will be done in a transparent way. But this concern of President, of President of is shared by many, by many people. people. And it's and great that, that you also that touched you upon education, education because according to the latest, latest, latest WD research, research Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan lost all the progress, all the progress that we had achieved over the last 10 years uh, in, in a human development index. So we also have an equality in terms of access, access, to, access to quality, access to quality to education, in terms of language instruction, medium instruction, in terms of urban and rural areas as well. Sir Suma, Sir Suma, you have asked in your capacity as advisor uh, to the president and as a member of the Supreme Council for Reform. Do you have also uh, voiced uh, recommendations for future reforms uh, and how the government is uh, studying the gap analysis uh, that you proposed? What is the main thrust? What is the main gist of your recommendation, Sir, Sir Suma? Thank you very much. Um, I think you're asking me about the gap in life. Uh, um, feedback, uh, which I'm getting on the translation. So um, let me try and answer your question. I've just switched off the interpretation for a minute. Um, so uh, in terms of the gap analysis, I was asked by the president to look at three areas. Uh, firstly, strategic and economic reform agenda. Uh, secondly, the whole question of, I put it very bluntly, public administration effectiveness, and thirdly, the whole question of uh, communication domestically and international branding of the country. Uh, and the gap analysis was not a small piece of work. Um, and as uh, the president himself remarked, it was a, you know exhausting process, uh, but it was also exhaustive. Over 100 interviews were carried out uh, during the autumn and winter 
uh, in producing that capital assets and huge amounts of paperwork uh, read. Um, and it says some new things and, and some fairly blunt things. It is essentially a, a pro-citizen, pro-business uh, agenda, pro-market economy agenda uh, for the country. Uh, and so just to highlight some of the things very briefly, because we're running out of time, in the strategy and economic reform uh, area, getting that strategic planning system to work well is going to be very important. So the creation of the Agency for Strategic Planning and Reform, I think, is a very good thing. Uh, I think also the creation of a new national development strategy, working with the Ministry of National Economy has been good, but it needs updating. And it needs updating, uh, I think, uh, every year after the President's uh, September speech uh, to make sure it's up to the mark. You know, long-term strategies which just sit there, uh, not being changed as the world around them changes, they're not much use to anyone. So that's a very important thing. Secondly, big focus on attracting investment. I think thinking about how to optimize and coordinate the process of attracting investment. And I think really within this, the heart of it is how to ensure that investors speak truth unto power, by which I mean they actually say what they think. Uh, and frankly, the more public those meetings are, the less they'll say and the less valuable they'll be. So trying to get the balance between public engagement with investors, but also private, collective, and individual discussions with government about investment climate issues is really important, I think. There's also a long-standing set of in investment disputes which have not been settled. Investors talk to each other, and they think about whether this country is the country they want to go to. And I think it's important for the Kazakh system to understand investors have choices. They don't have to come here. They can go elsewhere. So the reputation of the country you know, hangs on also its willingness to settle investment disputes, past ones as well. So there's a focus on that too. Privatization, uh, big focus, a lot of talk, but I think we've got to walk the talk. And things have been delayed. The pandemic, of course, has been part of the problem, but it was slow even before the pandemic. So I think we have to be honest and say, are we now going to implement the comprehensive privatization plan for 21 to 25? Uh, and that is very much a push that we are giving through uh, my uh, uh, roadmap. I think we also focus quite a lot on financial market development. And again, a number of uh, recommendations, but the heart of it is you know, letting the AIFC develop properly and building a proper partnership between AIFC and that central bank and the Agency for Financial Regulation as well. That's a partnership, a tripartite partnership that needs to be built going forward. And AIFC can be the heart of attracting more investment because it has international standards built into its DNA and its constitution. I think the other areas to emphasize also working with the Ministry of National Economy and others is to really uh, have a, a big push on deregulation, a bonfire of regulations. And so this whole question of uh, you know one in, two out is important. And we're support, giving it a big support with Atim Aken as well. Uh, and I think just reducing the number of mandatory requirements for business entities is very important too. Of course, the biggest issue for Kazakhstan has been facing for many years is diversification and uh, supporting productivity growth. It's still a low productivity economy and the need to get into new sectors, to identify those sectors, to attract foreign investors and others into those sectors, to have transfer technology, uh, add value in those sectors is um, high, you know, it's one of the things we mention a lot uh, in there. I think there's also the sense that uh, with Uzbekistan having finally opened up after 25 years of being a closed place and opened up to its neighbors, this is the other large economy in the region. And actually it's a very complementary economy in terms of the uh, sector uh, spread. So I think there are opportunities here for Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan to cooperate more um, on, in the economic space. And I think also on trade policy and export promotion, we can do a lot more to help uh, domestic exporters than they're currently doing. Climate change, I mentioned earlier, and I think low carbon pathway uh, has to be the top, one of the top priorities for this autumn to develop that, agree it, and then present it in Glasgow at COP26. So that's very, very important. And the other two issues that I think don't get discussed enough in Kazakhstan, if I can say this, one would be gender as, a, as an issue. I think it just isn't discussed enough. And... Uh, focused on enough. So we are um, 
putting forward ideas for improving the implementation of gender policy. I think the new uh, decree that's in draft at the moment on human rights is a really good step forward. It will, if it's approved, uh, end the uh, bar on women entering certain professions uh, altogether. That would be fantastic news. I think it's something that EBRD and Agris have been fighting for for many years. Uh, so I think it'll be a welcome change. The other area I think is inequality more generally. Um, for those who are economic nerds, and I used to be one once, uh, the Gini coefficient is going the wrong way in this country. And I think we should worry about that. We should also worry about regional inequality, as Timur mentioned earlier as well. Uh, we need to worry about uh, the speed at which different regions are progressing. That's the first pillar, and it's got the most recommendations in it and most actions in it. The second pillar is focusing on public administration effectiveness. So, you know, I have to say, you know, this is something I, I am steeped in because of my past in the British Civil Service, but also the EBRD, because we completely revamped the way EBRD works uh, in terms of, you know, really focusing on the client even more. Um, so I, I, I've, I've tried to put forward four or five things which I think could actually help in the medium term Kazakhstan improve its uh, public service effectiveness without actually being, without having a revolution in the public service, which I think is not possible. I think one of the biggest things, underlying things, by the way, is the quality of public service is that the pay uh, remuneration rates are far too low. Uh, and so it's very difficult to attract really good people. And secondly, the culture whereby it's a culture of decision making only at the top, everything gets floated up. So you, no one at middle level takes any decisions, has any experience of taking decisions, and is actually scared of taking decisions. Let's be frank about that. That has to change uh, as Kazakhstan moves forward. Um, now it's a, a higher middle income country, it really has to change. But I have put uh, four or five things together. One is, I think, creating a more of a team reform, Kazakhstan building a team amongst the uh, senior ministers uh, uh, in terms of trying to uh, have regular discussions between them, the president and prime minister, about the reform process and program. I think it's really fundamental. Most countries do that. Uh, we used to do that in Kazakhstan, actually, a long time ago but uh, it hasn't happened for many years, and I think we should get back to doing that. Secondly, we discussed already the strategy setting and policy making processes, so I won't repeat that. I think actually we're making progress here with the Supreme Council and with uh, the agency for strategic planning. I think the third thing is some things to do with building a more professional civil service. Um, I would uh, particularly think, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, the number of proposals here, but the one I would focus on, we have an extremely good, presidential youth reserve uh, pool, but we don't utilize it properly. Um, some highly talented people in that thing, uh, but they're getting frustrated and they have a lot to offer. Some are in the private sector, some are in the public sector. Let's use them. And uh, I think both Governor Kelim Betov and I would like to use them to help with national projects and to help with implementation of this roadmap too. The other thing I want to do is work with a set of ministers um, who are you know, definitely people who want to reform their own ministries, uh, and that includes the Ministry of National Economy, where the minister, an ex-EBRD person, of course, uh, as it, uh, it Galiev, he also wants to improve the ministry. Uh, and these ministers have said, we want to have capability reviews, whereby we actually look at the capability of the ministry and compare it with what it is now and where it needs to be in order to achieve its objective objectives and have an action plan for improving its capability. And, and the other area that I think we need to have is with this focus that the president rightly wants on outcomes, on what does a citizen care about, and this is going to be important in national projects, is to have a central government delivery unit, uh, close to the president, but with real uh, people who understand data and who understand the use of data as well and can actually help then say what is on track, what is off track, and what should we do about it, and work with the ministries to do that better. And there are plenty of examples that started in the UK 25 years ago, but there are plenty of really good examples in emerging markets. For example, Malaysia would be a very good example. So a recent, more recent example. And the final uh, sort of area I think uh, I want to focus on, I think, uh, in this public administration space, is the whole simplification, digitization agenda. So strong support to Baghdad Musin and his people in taking forward that digitization agenda, because I think, I think a lot of time is wasted in, in the public service doing unnecessary tasks, and which we simply haven't got rid of, 
because they've always been done that way. So it's never a good answer when you ask, why do we do this this way? Uh, never a good answer to say, we've always done it this way. Uh, you know, it makes my blood boil when I hear people saying that. You know, try and think of why we do this. Do we need to do it? And can we simplify it? Can we use, can we digitize it? It's very important too. And I'd like to offer also in-service executive education for the highest potential public servants as well. I think they need uh, more experience uh, of international practice and um, you know, so, so arranging for some sort of in-service executive education of the highest potential public servants is also on the agenda as well. The final area, communications and branding. I think um, the president is right, and he said, you know, I want uh, a state. He says, which uh, gets good feedback uh, from its citizens and can respond and design its policies accordingly with feedback. That's great, and there are examples of one or two younger ministers, younger Akims, who are beginning to do that. Um, but as a generality, the state is still transmitting, not receiving. It's still transmitting one way, top down. And, you know, that needs to change. If you want good policy, you need to listen to what the public is telling you, uh, not what you're telling the public. And so I think that's a really important mindset shift that we've got to work on. More engagement with civil society is part of that as well. And I think we need to look at the branding of Kazakhstan. Um, it has a very rich pre-Soviet past, which we don't use in our branding very much. And it could also improve its brand if it really focused now on the reforms to come as well. Uh, there are plenty of good examples of countries with brands, despite the political situation sometimes, where, whether it be Singapore or UAE, uh, Baltic states, Georgia. Um, so plenty of states where, you know, which have had a similar economic history, political history, but also states with different uh, political systems. And I think we should learn lessons and find a Kazakh way forward. Uh, and in this regard, I do think the appointment of Erjan Kazikhanov as a president's representative is a very good one, actually, in terms of helping uh, engage internationally on branding issues with EU, US, UK, and so on. Уважаемый господин Чекрабарти, прошу прощения. К сожалению, у нас ограничения по времени. Здесь 55. Uh, Sir Suma, unfortunately, we're limited for time. Uh, uh, at uh, 10.55, uh, another session is uh, scheduled to begin. Uh, so I was reluctant uh, to interrupt you, but unfortunately, we have uh, to stop right now. And uh, we have uh, a lot of questions that have been raised, that have been asked. And we have uh, a lot of uh, people, a lot of uh, speakers uh, who wanted to share their opinions. Uh, but I believe uh, that Mr. Kalimbetov and Sir Suma, uh, you are very important. That's why we gave you an opportunity to speak uh, fully because it's uh, very important for everybody, for all in some right, to get uh, uh, answers uh, to the questions uh, firsthand uh, from you. So this concludes the session. Thank you very much uh, to all the viewers and uh, to the organizers. Thank you very much uh, for organizing and for holding this uh, session. And uh, we, as citizens of Kazakhstan, we have high hopes uh, for positive results uh, to come soon. Thank you very much. This concludes this session.